Um, and uh, during each session, I bring people who from different positions in the IDF who share their experiences uh, and personal stories. And so I'm really happy that today I can uh, also have my sister here, Nama Asner, who was a Mashaki Kash, which I have not really found out how to say in English, but basically is equivalent to a social worker in the army. Nama, perhaps if you know or you interviewed about it, maybe you can shed light on it. If not, it's totally okay. Sure. <laughs> so, but I, but, um, and Noah is a, a casualty officer, so me meaning that she works with um, families and also wounded soldiers in the army. Um, and as an officer, she has more responsibility than soldiers who have a similar position. So um, now mom and sister will speak first, and then Noah will speak afterwards. And uh, then again, if you have questions uh, during um, the, the call itself, please feel free to just write it in the chat, and then I will read it at the end of the session. But I know that sometimes people want to write it once they uh, connect. Um, uh, so what, once, they, once they have the question in their mind, so feel free. And also, if you guys now see Yakir Asner is joining us, uh, he's usually not able to join because he's in the Army, but he's currently uh, off. So I'm actually very happy that he can connect and join as well. Uh, he just began his military service literally a month ago as a combat soldier in the Nahal Brigade. Um, and I'm, he hasn't, I don't know if he's hearing me because he's just connecting to audio, but it's okay. It's okay that I embarrass him as well. Um, so thank you for joining Yakir, and I'm going to mute you. Uh, and I will let Nama begin by here, spotlighting her. There we go. Hello, everybody. I'm Nama, as Nick said. I'm currently living in Chicago this year. Um, I am 21 years old. I finished my army service a year ago in August, and then I came here in September. Um, I'm currently spending the year here working as an au pair with a family, um, living in the Jewish community here. Um, so I guess I'll just start. So I was an equivalent of a social worker in the army. Um, what I did every day was help um, soldiers with financial, if they had financial issues or problems or difficulties with them or their families. So we, would, we sometimes could help with financial aid. Um, we also helped lone soldiers. I'll get to that in a, in a minute. Um, I was based on the um, transport unit, um, one of their bases. It's basically, the I was working with truck drivers. My soldiers specifically came to my base for basic training and then they learned how to drive the trucks. Um, and eventually they would become drivers and drive, it was usually supplies. Sometimes if they went through further training, they would actually be driving special um, armed trucks that would, um, they were transporting actual soldiers on the borders. Um, so my soldiers were beginning soldiers, they were in training. Um, the army itself targeted the soldiers that they brought to our base um, that were from difficult backgrounds or impoverished. Um, a lot of soldiers were high school dropouts. They were working to support their families before their IDF service. And once they got to the army, it was a little hard for them because they couldn't work anymore because they were in the army all the time. Um, so that's where I came in. They would come to me. Their first, when they first come, so we do a special screening. We kind of like interview everybody see what their situation is. We ask about their family's income, um, any issues that they have. Another thing that we would help with is, with is um, their conditions, their serving conditions. So if someone needed to be at home because they have an ill family member that lives with them, that's something that we could help with to get them recognition that they needed to be home every day. And then they would usually switch positions and not become truck drivers. Um, so that's mainly, it was a lot of bureaucracy. Um, there were a lot of things I needed to fill out. There were forms, I would have to bring bank statements and it would go through the chain of um, officers and only officers would be approving different requests. Um, but that's what I did. I also did a lot of home visits. I did, I think over 50. Um, I visited these soldiers' homes. I saw how they lived a lot of times in really difficult conditions. Um, some of the soldiers were even, didn't have enough basic appliances in their house, and that's something that we could really help with. We had um, organizations helping the army that could provide even ovens or um, refrigerators if they didn't have enough beds for the number of people living in their house. Um, and in extreme cases, we could also provide different housing for soldiers um, if there was a problem with too many people in one house. Um, what's it called? Sfifut? Um. Can you say that? No, I don't know why I'm looking at John. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to continue now. Yeah, yeah, overcrowded. So sometimes okay, we can help Thank with you. That. <laughs> um, 
Another thing that we did, there were, so there are two types of lone soldiers. I'm sure most of you only know about lone soldiers who um, live, come from abroad to serve in the IDF. There's another type of lone soldiers that are soldiers that come that either from, they're giving their um, family conditions for some reason if they have any like really bad relationships with their parents or even abuse um, background, then they can be recognized as lone soldiers and then they get different benefits of they get housing, they get even if they want to um, uh, rent an apartment, so they get aid, financial aid with renting an apartment and they have a special recognition as um, special soldiers because of that. Um, I had a few soldiers that needed that help, either if it's because their family are from like ultra orthodox backgrounds and their family um, objected to them going to the army and they wouldn't let them live at home or they just kicked them out of the house and these soldiers were left with no home. So that was something that we could help with and get them that recognition. Um, a lot of it is just circumstances. If parents come from abusive background or they, I also had some soldiers that were in foster care and once they're 18, they're, they're, their foster parents um, aren't obligated to keep them in the house anymore and then these soldiers have nowhere to be. Um, so that was another thing that we also helped with. There are um, soldier, it's called Batei Chayad, soldier housing around, throughout um, Israel. So they could be there, they have a few soldiers in a room and they provide, um, a lot of times they provide, um, uh, they have rooms and they have meals and they also have washing machines. Um, so that's about lone soldiers. I was asked to specifically talk about two meaningful stories or um, experiences in my army service. So I'm going to share two specific stories about two soldiers that I helped that were really meaningful for me. Um, the first soldier, he had a very interesting story. He was 28 years old. He came, he made Aliyah on his own from the Ukraine. Um, no, I think it was from Russia actually. Anyway, somewhere <laughs> over there. Um, he was divorced and had a five-year-old kid that lived there in um, in, Ru in Russia, I think it was. Um, and I hadn't met him for the first part of my service because he had kidney stones and he was away on special leave for eight months. Um, and that's where Noah's part comes in a little bit. I had a little bit of contact with um, um, a uh, soldier that's in charge of injured um, soldiers. So that's how I would get through to him because he wasn't administratively, he wasn't under our unit anymore and it was a little complicated to take care of him, but he still needed a lot of our help financially and, and all of that. So that was a big issue to take care of. Um, so by the time he came, um, then eventually he, he, was, he got better and he came on base and he had a lot of motivation. He really wanted to be a truck driver. Um, and uh, so one of the things that we are obliged to do is do home visits for these soldiers and see how they're living and their conditions and if they need any help. And I remember he lived in a small little apartment in Haifa. Um, and I think he, he didn't even have an oven or a microwave to heat up his own food. So that's something that we helped him with. Um, and another big thing that we are able to do for lone soldiers who come from abroad is to fly them home once, I think it's once in their, during their army service, it get, they can get it funded and they also have special leave if they want to fund it themselves. So that was something that we really worked hard to do because his um, ex-wife, I think she was ill and he also wanted to visit his five-year-old son who he hadn't seen in over a year. Um, so he needed to help her and he also wanted to see his mother. So that was something that I helped him do. He filled out all the papers and he didn't know much Hebrew. So when, once the, the request got approved. I remember driving with him with um, a driver from my platoon over to Tel Aviv to the offices of, um, it's called, there's a certain organization that helps, specifically helps. So it's Amutal Gudal Man Chayal. What is it called? Ah, it doesn't matter. Anyway, we went over there. They got, they, they filled out um, all the forms where exactly wants to go. And then from there, we drove over to another, um, to um, a traveling agency to actually get him his tickets. And I, and I, mamash, I, um, no, what, okay, it doesn't matter. Um, and, and we got him his tickets and he was supposed to fly, I think that was on a Thursday. And he was supposed to fly on um, Saturday night. And I just, that was a moment where I could actually see how much I was helping and impacting one soldier because I could see it so like vividly that I, 
that he was actually getting to fly home for 30 days to see his kid and his mother. And to me, that was one of the most meaningful things. I remember on my way home, and it was on a Thursday. Usually I would go home on Thursdays, and I stayed longer. I got home much later that day because I stayed with him in Tel Aviv and then uh, rode home from there. And even though it was late, I think it was, I had a lot going on. And even though it was late, I just remembered that that was one of the most meaningful days of my army service. And I remember just being very grateful for being able to do that and help him. So that was one meaningful story. And the soldier, Bichal, there were a lot of, um, Mitha, do you want to say something? No, I just wanted to say that the organization is called United for Israel Soldiers. So that's what, yeah, that's what it's called. It's, a, it's okay. not Friends of the IDF. It's called United for Israel Soldiers. So they probably exactly. help more Isra soldiers in Israel, meaning rather than yeah, a lone soldier. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but they also, yeah, they do a lot of work. That, that organization also donates um, appliances and a lot of financial aid for soldiers. Um, what else do I want to say about him? Another thing with him was there's a certain request that if you're married or if you're divorced, you can get financial aid from the army to help you either pay um, mezonot alimony, is that what it's called? If you're divorced. Wait, let me check. I'm going to check. I think it's that. Um, to pay your ex-wife, I think that's what it's called. Um, and it was a big story. It was a big issue with him because he would pay. So I'm not going to get into it. But anyway, he was a, he was a soldier that really, um, that was really meaningful for me to help. And Yeah, it's to, called alimony. Yeah. I mean, work with? By law, yeah. Okay. So I'll share the next story now. Um, I had another soldier who was also from Russian background, but he lived here with his mother. Um, he had... Um, his mother um, was living with, and he had a younger sister and an older sister. Um, he came to me from a different base first, and it turned out that he didn't really, his mother what, didn't have, was living on the streets because she couldn't pay her rent, and she was just kicked out of their house. Um, and he didn't, he, we were able to arrange for him to live, to stay in one of the soldiers homes that, that I, that I mentioned before, but he wouldn't want to because he wouldn't leave his mother on the streets alone. At first she was, she sometimes would be able to sleep over at her friend's houses. That wasn't really a long-term solution. Um, and the problem was that he could never actually finish basic training even because he needed to help support his mother and work and take care of her. He would actually, um, how do you say nifkad? Uh, was it? Yeah, absent, absent from the army. Like he, he, absent. he just yeah. wouldn't come because of the, uh, the situation at home. His mother's bank account was. Um, don't, don't, go, don't go to the specifics so much, but yeah. No, I'm just saying she didn't have any, it so doesn't matter, but it was a very difficult situation. Um, and it came to a point where we just wanted him to have permit to, um, recognition that he could just leave the army because that was the only way that we could find a solution for him because it was a really, um, extreme situation. Um, it took a long time. And that was something that I really put a lot of work into. And there's a special request that you can ask to shorten your army service. Um, and I remember it went back and forth three times. I, I sent it in and then they didn't approve it or it didn't even go up to the right chain of command to, to check it but finally once the officer was even switched and there was someone else in the position the next day he immediately was um, dismissed of his army service because it was such an extreme um, situation I actually contacted him a lot long ago to just check in with him and said that now they have a home and they were able to rent an apartment and um, that's all so that was something that I remember that I was working with him a lot and it was a very difficult situation with him um, another thing that we would do is towards the Chagim, the holidays, we would have, we would get a lot of donations from, um, organizations to be able to help soldiers. Um, if it was even food, packaged food, like food packages that we would give out and the, the commanders themselves would go to the, to the soldiers' homes and give it out the day before the holiday. Um, and also lone soldiers and other type of soldiers, they would get, um, a special stipend. Um, for Rosh Hashanah and for, I think it was Pesach. Um, I think I'll just share like what exactly my, my day would look like. I stayed on base. I, I stayed a full week on base. I would, go, I would come on Sunday and leave on Thursday. Um, so I was actually sleeping on base as opposed to my sisters who went in daily. Um, and my, I usually, I would be in my office by 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, I had my own office. That was really nice. It's not um, 
common usually. Um, and my work was administrative work, but also work, I would work with soldiers. Soldiers would come to me or ask to see me to, to, to tell me anything that they need help with. Um, they would give in the forms that they needed to. Sometimes I'd have to sit with the, with the soldiers on the computer and help them print out the forms from their like, bank statements or anything because they needed help with that. Um, and then also I needed to, I, I was pretty much independent with my own schedule. I had to schedule um, home visits. And I also had the work in the office and also meeting soldiers and, and figuring that out with their commanders. Um, there were four more um, soldiers that had the same position as me on my base. So we were a very nice, close, tight group. So it was really helpful to have them with me. We also shared a room, all the girls. Um, we would eat lunch on base and then I would go back and continue working until the evening. Some nights we would work till late. Some of the girls would be working till 12, till midnight or even after because they were just swamped with work. Um, that is how my day looks like. Is there anything else? Any questions? Anything else I should be saying? We have questions at the end, Nama. But okay. I feel I feel like that you, that you really presented well what what your what your service looked like. That I mean, people imagine you know when you're on uniform how um, you know the combat and certain things. We don't think about that there are people that people come from different backgrounds because it's um, you have mandatory service in Israel, you really, here, I'm just going to change this. Um, because you have mandatory in Israel, you really have to, um, you have to be aware that soldiers come from different backgrounds, basically. And Nama is there to take care of people who come from more difficult backgrounds and take care. And I, I think you once told me something that's really strong in my mind, that basically 93 or 97% of the people who were on Nama's base were people who had, um, a record or had or were taken care of by somebody who was in her position so you re, it was a really a base of a, a high percentage of people who uh, needed that assistance um is there mm -hmm. anything else you want to add nama or do you want me to share some share some pictures or is that uh ah you can share some pictures yeah sure so I, yeah. I, here do you want to share your yeah. screen yeah i'm trying to do that right okay now. and afterwards we'll hear from you Yes. So this is me in training. Wait, in my N16, that's the only time I actually was like holding a weapon or did anything. I did have a week of guard duty. Do you want to open it, Nama? Here, because we it's very small. Um, click on it. Yeah, please. Nama. I don't know what I'm doing. Wait. But I, I opened it. Right now. You have to, if then if you go back and share your screen, you have to get out. Can you see it? No, you have to, you have to go out of the share screen and go in again to share the specific picture. There you go. Now? Yes, now we can see it. And if I, so this was me in training. That was the only time during my service almost that I was actually with a weapon. Um, no. can you can you see that I'm when I switch to the other pictures? Yep. It's not tight enough. That's the ceremony. Um, when I actually my we had a special lace. Ours was purple. That was specifically for my position. Um, so that's when I got at the end of um my training. And this is when we gave blood. That was one of the things that we also do. They come and and uh, we donate blood as soldiers. Um, I fell asleep. I'd be, sometimes we would, with uh, our friends at night, sometimes we would do guitar nights and we would sing together. So that was, that was a fun experience, part of the army service. Um, this was my desk. I don't know if that's really interesting to see, but a lot of sticky notes. Um, oh, this wasn't, this is me. This is one of the soldiers I was talking about. It's actually good that you can't see his face. I would do a lot when we, when we would go to home visits. I would actually have someone to drive me from my base. We had cars. That is actually uncommon for um, uh, soldiers in my position. Usually, we would have to take public transportation, but because we were a transport unit, so we had a lot of cars, and we were able to um, actually drive. And this was me in a truck. Um, it, I found that kind of exciting. This is when I voted. I was also in charge of our um, uh, voting the Kalpi. 
the um, voting booth, the voting yeah. booth in inner inner base specifically. Yes, and this is the head of my base. We would meet with him once a week. Um, there were certain things that he had to sign off on or approve, and he just wanted to know what the situation with the soldiers was, if there were any problems that he could take care of. And this is when we celebrated his birthday. We made him a special um, crown. So this is a, these are the other four um, um, soldiers in my position. And that is it. Okay, I'm done, I think. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. So um, I will just note that as you could see, now Nama has, um, wait, where am I? Here we go. Um, Nama had a special string that was purple and that is how you identify her on base and that is her position. And um, that's what she did. So it's one of the few, one of the few positions that have a string or um, that identifies them in their position. So for example, I was in the spokesperson's unit. I had nothing identifying me besides the, my, my tag on this, I think, I don't remember. Um, and uh, um, I'm trying to think what, oh, most of the people who are in this position are in fact women, but you saw there was a, a man and often um, people who you need men for, um, for example, for ultra orthodox soldiers. So if they do home visits, you have a man visiting rather than a woman in uniform and you have to be sensitive to that as well. So correct me if I'm wrong, but usually there's often more women in these positions. Um, yes. The, okay. the men are usually only for ultra orthodox um, platoons. That's what we had on our base. Okay. That one. Great. So um, now I will refer to Noah and I will put you in the spotlight as well. Okay. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> so um, Noah is someone that I actually found uh, via social media. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I did Pleasure. Not, thank you. I did not know Noah before I did this session, before I reached out. And I think it's amazing that we have somebody from a different background who, as, as what I have here, you drafted in 2006. Yeah, in three, actually. In three? I'm old. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, Noah joining us from Israel also. So I appreciate also you joining us at night. And she's a she's in reserve duty as well. So she she finished her military service, but immediately went to continue as a reserve um, officer, do, as a casualty officer, um, and is a lawyer. But the last few years has been working as an analyst in the prime minister's office. So thank you so much and feel free to introduce yourself and tell about your service <laughs> and experiences. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Okay, well, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, it's always a pleasure uh, to introduce uh, this job because I will tell you a bit about them, about it, uh, but basically it's a unique job. Uh, there's no other army in the world that has casualty officers, uh, other Wait, no, 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 we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Wait, I can't hear you now either. Yeah, your sound is gone. Yeah, we, oh wait, now, can you try again? No, we can't hear you. Do you wanna try to go in and out perhaps? Okay. Um, okay. Maybe, thank you. Okay. So now you are, Nama, you are on the, so in the meantime, while we're waiting um, for Noah to come back, does anybody have any questions for Nama specifically that you'd wanna ask? This could be a good time to ask already now. Um, if not, I, I just want to point out, I think that it's very unique regarding, you know, Israel, that it's, um, you have mandatory service, basically. So you really are getting people that are not only volunteering, but you're getting people from the, you know, really wide variety of people. You have lone soldiers, but you also have lone soldiers in Israel as well. Here I see that Taibo has a question. So feel free to ask or unmute yourself or. And John also asked. Oh, John. Okay. Oh, okay. It's just my firstborn. If no one's asking, I feel the need to ask. So whatever. I just wondered whether the experience of being a social worker changed what you wanted to do with your life. Um, actually, it didn't. Um, 
but it was an interesting experience and for me it was very important to to meet with other people that otherwise I don't think I would have met um, um, people from these backgrounds um, because I didn't have much interaction Um, so for me it was very I learned a lot um, from them and it was very important to me to experience that and I by chance I got placed at that specific base but um, but anyway like we would be dealing with and helping um, soldiers from that background. But no, it didn't have an impact. It just, even more so, it just made me know that I don't want to be working in that field at all. Nama, do you want to share what you plan to do or did you share already if I missed it? I haven't. I'm going to be studying mechanical engineering at the Technio next year, God willing. Neda, I have a question. Yeah, go for it. When, when your time uh, as an active duty soldier is up, do you sign up to be a reservist or, or are you automatically a reservist for X amount of years? Um, so I can just answer that. Um, mm-hmm. So you have to sign up. You're, you have mandatory service and whatever you want to do afterwards, um, you have to be willingly doing reserve duty. I'll also say though that... Um, Men in combat will be doing reserve duty longer than women uh, who are not. So for example, uh, probably once I have a baby, uh, I think that I'm like officially not in reserve duty. Um, but I did, for example, one day, you know, I'm not talking about two weeks of reserve duty. Now my position doesn't require reserve duty, but for example, officers might be called up for reserve duty in various yeah. cases. And for example, that's why Noah is a casualty officer because she's an officer, she still does reserve duty still today. Um, yes. Do you hear me now? Yes. Oh, great. So Wonderful. hi. So I'm okay. Glad Did you, you hear everything I said before, or okay? Well, we, no, we, heard, we, heard, we heard the beginning part. We heard that you said okay. that this was the last thing we heard you say was that um, that this there's no other uh, place like this. There's no other yeah. um, army. army in the world that has a position like this. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let me. So okay. I'm going to make you this, this spotlight speaker, but continue in the meantime. And, yeah. Okay, so great. So uh, I'll just tell you a bit about, about myself. Neta introduced me. Uh, so as she said, I'm 35 years old. I uh, actually was um, in the army about 15 years ago, but I'm still serving uh, as, a, as an officer in reserve duty. Um, so I'm married to Ido and... I'm a, I'm a mom to Nevo, he's a 10 months old baby. And aside from my day job, uh, twice a year I get called to the army, I put on my uniform and I go to visit families that lost their sons or their daughters during their army service. And just to, to clarify what this job means actually, so a casualty officer is a position in which we are responsible to the non-medical um, care of, first of all, two, two subjects. The first one is soldiers that uh, got sick or wounded during their army service. It can be, God will, we, we don't want soldiers to, to be injured, but if it happens um, in car accidents, in during their service, actual service in combat, in all types of, uh, it can be in all kinds of uh, uh, situations, but if you're a soldier, first of all, there's someone who will also, uh, do, let's say, aside from the medical attention, will call and see if everything is okay. Neta, uh, uh, sorry, now I must add earlier, that uh, usually when there's uh, a long medical care, um, these soldiers are sent home to, to stay at home to heal. And then sometimes the, the situation is more complex because uh, sometimes the, the home environment is more complex or he needs something else. And besides, he loses connection with, with his unit. So he needs someone to be the mediator and to come and visit and to see that everything was okay, or maybe just to listen, uh, which is something that is important to itself. So, and the other subject that we are taking care of are families that lost their sons and daughters during their army service. 
and you hear also uh, all the time about uh, uh, soldiers that died in, in, in combat, but it can also be soldiers who commit suicide during their army service because of the circumstances of their service. It can be soldiers that uh, passed after a disease or something that happened to them during their army service. Um, the IDF looks at all his soldiers as we draft them and we see them eye to eye, everyone are equal and the same. We don't really uh, modify uh, the care uh, according to the circumstances of their death. So we take care of all soldiers, all families that uh, lost their sons or daughters during their army service. Um, so what does it actually mean? Um, it means that we come to house visits, uh, we sit and listen. Uh, at the end of it, I'm not a social worker, I'm not any type, I'm not, uh, I'm not any type of uh, professional, but I'm there, I'm the family's um, contact person to the army, which means that they know that there is someone, there is a phone uh, and a person behind it that is also always there to answer their, their calls. Um, I can tell you that one of the, the most amazing things are that this is a care that lasts actually for years. As I started um, my, uh, my, um, my service, uh, I had widows that lost their husbands in the independence war, um, which is amazing because the connection with the families is lasting. It's like there's no okay, ten years or five years passed. Okay, it's a, we finished. Uh, we actually accompany all families throughout life, um, and uh, that's something that sometimes you say that um, pain dulls with time, but it really doesn't. So um, it really shows that it's is important for them even after all these years that we come and we sit and we listen to their stories uh, even after long after all their family members don't really want to hear the same old story over and over again and I'm there just to hear that just to to come and look at the pictures and to actually talk about everything they want to to talk about uh, and of course, there's another part, which is organizing all memorial services, uh, also personal, uh, azkara, uh, which is uh, the, the personal pass on the pass passing of the, um, the soldier or um, of the unit. Sometimes we organize like a ceremony once a year, usually, but we invite all families. So it's something that we also are in charge of and we organize it. Um, so that basically um, the their responsibility, uh, let's say. But as uh, Nama said, what a typical day looks like. Uh, well, actually, I'm uh, usually my day is I see only civilians because I visit hospitals and intensive care units and rehabilitation centers and I, I go for I don't really sit in a base I go and like travel all over the country I go to house visits and sometimes I have families in Kiryat Shmona and in the north and sometimes I have families in Be'er Sheva and then in the south so basically day in day out um, my day can be going to Mount Herzl to, to a ceremony there, and after that to a hospital, and to finish off uh, at a home visit for a family that lives nearby. Um, it varies, but um, basically the job is to visit civilians and to be the contact person of them to the army. So that's, uh, that's the... Um, um, what a day looks like. 
um, and to share with you a story um, I decided to tell you about uh, a special woman um, her name is Lucy and uh, she's someone I, I spoke with her a couple hours ago she's 96 years old and she's an amazing woman she um, she came to Israel uh, from Argentina um, around 1960, something like that. And she came here with her husband and she only had one, one child at a time. And they lived here in, uh, in a kibbutz up, uh, up north. And uh, she's an amazing woman because uh, I always talk about resilience and she's the the epic of it uh, because she lost both of her sons at the same day in the <coughs> I'm sorry in the Yom Kippur uh, war I'm sorry excuse me and <coughs> um, Yair is her youngest son he was uh, in mandatory service and when the war broke, he was called to Sinai, to the uh, southern uh, front. And Yair is her oldest son, and he was actually in reserve service. He was already married, and <coughs> I'm sorry. And uh, uh, his, uh, his wife was expecting, she was like eight months pregnant when he was called to the army and he was um he was an officer and was called to the north front he was he fought in the ramata golan and actually they both uh died in combat the same day uh and when uh, lucy and her husband were notified about Yair's um, uh, passing actually he was the he was injured and then he was a uh, few hours later he was um, actually uh, passed away from his wounds then they say okay we need to inform his other brother and when they looked for him they found out that he also uh, died the same day um, and in spite of it in spite of the really it's a uh, grief that we can't even imagine. She had another uh, child. She had a, a, another daughter. And she actually had uh, Yair's uh, wife, which she, she always says she's like a second daughter to her. Mm -hmm. And they continue to, to live throughout the pain. But um, she was an English teacher and she had a wonderful career and a wonderful family that expanded after uh, both of uh, her sons actually passed away. But um, my visits to her home are always um, very <laughs> unique because although her age and everything that she went through in life, she's a very strong woman and she's always talking about um, about how meaningful it is for her uh, that uh, both of her son's friends still come uh, under uh, memorial uh, services and still stay in touch and they do all kinds of um like uh i'm, I'm not sure the word is like uh all kinds of services actually to memorize uh the memory of their sons and um actually when i come to visit her i always say to her that i i don't have anything smart to say i'm there to listen to her and to hear about yair and and about uh, pinky about the other son pinchas uh, because i think it's a privilege for me to learn about them to learn from her life experience um so it's something that I always um, look forward to actually to come there and <clears throat> just listen to her to be um, to be someone 
to be an ear, uh, <laughs> to be someone to, that she can actually talk to and, and share whatever she feels like at that moment. Um, and another story, very short one, and then I'll be clear on the stage, um, is about uh, Nuit, uh, which is a widow. Uh, I, I'm visiting, actually. Uh, she lost her husband, her first husband, uh, which uh, his name was Amikam. Um, they actually met in the army, both of them served at the same base. And years after they, um, they actually uh, left the, the army and started going to the university and uh, got married. And he was called to just, uh, let's say, um, normal uh, reserve uh, duty in the north border. And his, um, his car um, was, um, let's say, it, mm, sorry. I can see, uh, think clearly, but uh, um, a mind blew and, oh. and she, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> and a mind blew and he was uh, injured and after 10 days in the hospital, he was, um, he was, he passed away actually, uh, that was 1971 and they were, at, at that time, they were married for about a year and they don't have any joint uh, children and uh, I think she said that probably two years after that she got married and she has three wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful children. And when I come to her, she always say that he was her great first love. Uh, although she she had a wonderful marriage life with someone else, um, it doesn't take away from the um, first of all from their relationship. And the other thing that uh, she said that along the years, she always thinks about, uh, think about um, what he missed, how they missed life, their joint life together. Uh, what, what would have happened if things were, um, were different? So I think that basically um, it's two stories that just, show you what it feels like to to come to families and hear their stories. It doesn't necessarily mean that I have something to help them, but what I offer them is actually the to show them that when I come, no matter how much time it, pa it passed from uh, the passing of their loved ones, uh, I still come in uniforms. I still come as the IDF representative to show them that we remember, <clears throat> that we want to hear, that we are here for them. Uh, and it's something that is very, very, I think, important for, um, for the IDF itself um, to show that it's not all about saying, okay, tomorrow is uh, the national, uh, um, uh, the National Remembrance Day, and after that it's the Independence Day, and that's it. Uh, we remember every day, and I think it's a very strong message that we send to all families, actually. Thank you so, so much. I, I've cried multiple times to, uh, during your presentation. No, I, I cry from everything. It's okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I also, when Nama was texting me before the session, do you, do you want to share what, or I'll, I'll just share what you said, uh, but that we both, that we both have a hard time now because she's in Chicago and I'm in the States. I'm in, I'm both in the States. I'm in Maryland, she's in Chicago, that um, this time is, is really hard for both of us being in, being not in Israel because, uh, because of Yom Azikon and Yom Atzimot where we, we really feel Israeli. We really feel we're part of the country. You know, I live in Jerusalem. We both live in Jerusalem. And I, I would often go to Mount Herzl myself, even though there's a million people there. Um, but it's just, you really feel you're part, you're Israeli and you're part of this huge family. Um, and you really feel that it's lacking. And I'm sure also in Israel, it's not the same thing with being a part. Yeah. There's no celebrations happening or commemorations. People 
the fact is, is that I know that in Israel right now, uh, people are, um, there's a complete shutdown, lockdown. People cannot go to graves. People cannot celebrate Yom Um uh, And the reason is because they know that, that this, these days are so meaningful and so powerful to a lot of people that they made sure to shut it down. So um, it's definitely difficult and a unique situation th this year. So um, now we'll go to our questions. And I know that I, I saw some already from before and now. So um, I'll start with um, the, John asked Nama, and I'll start with that because Noah just spoke. Um, why? Why wouldn't you want to? What? What? What was it in your position that made you not want to continue with it? Meaning, um, you can you said it that Dafka, like specifically doing the position, made you not want to deal with something like that in the future to not be a social worker. Um, I think for me, also one of the hardest things about my position was um, the emotional um, uh, weight of it. Um, having to deal with all these stories and feeling res some, I also felt responsible for them and I, there wasn't much we could help, but we couldn't help and actually fix their problems. We couldn't make an impoverished family get a better income for forever. Um, and I had a hard time with that. I remember having a lot of conversations with my officer, um, my professional officer, and she would explain that what we can do is it's kind of like a band aid. We're just trying to help and make things a little easier for the soldiers, but we can't fix their problems. Um, and that was something that was a little hard for me to deal with. So I think in the long run, that's not something that I would want to do because it would just be too hard for me. Thank you for sharing that. And I'll do the next question to Noah that someone already wrote. Um, and okay. And Noah, so Noah, some, there's someone here, Miriam asked, um, how often do you visit the family? So Lucy and Wait, how often do you speak to them? Do you see them? Okay, so um, because I'm in reserve uh, duty, uh, it's uh, different. Um, officers in mandatory and um, professional, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, no, um, how would you say they're on? Uh... Army career. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank so you, Nama. They <laughs> <laughs> so they do this day in, day out, which means it depends on um, on the unit, um, let's, let's say um, in my unit, I served in the 7th Brigade of the Armed uh, Corps, and they had about 550 families. So you don't visit, uh, it, it rarely happens that you visit like several times a month uh, uh, the same family uh, because you want to, to reach out to everyone. So it depends, but there are units that are smaller and they have, um, let's say, less casualties. So uh, they reach out more, but uh, let's say that at least uh, once a year there's a home visit, but uh, the thing of, uh, is that there are a lot of uh, other ways to meet the families. Uh, besides uh, going to um, memorial services uh, in the units or uh, at uh, the cemeteries, um, we have a lot of activities that we do with the, with the casualty fa uh, casualties uh, uh, families that are um, we try to to give other chances. We have concerts and lots of other things that we meet the families. Uh, for example, Lucy and Nurit, which I told you about, uh, I meet them twice a year before Rosh Hashanah and before Pesach. Uh, but what happened this year because of the the coronavirus uh, period, um, we actually uh, for their safety because. Uh, because of their age and everything, um, we actually made phone calls. Uh, I spoke to, with them before Pesach, after Pesach, and today before uh, the um, actually Independence Day. So, but usually I meet them twice a year. Okay, thank you. And I'll just continue because there's another question. Um, do you meet the same, do all casualty officers generally, and it seems that you do meet the same people, do you um, meet the same families throughout a long period of time? How does it yes. work? Yes. Um, 
well actually i visit now i i visit my families for about five five years already so uh we do know them uh it's not like a visit and okay that's it we disappear uh so it's it's a it's a connection actually uh but also uh during the, my service um we actually come for every every um position that you take is at least uh for three or four years so you know the families you see them a couple of times Okay, thank you. And I think this will be the last question before we summarize. Um, so I'll start with Nova because you're already in the spotlight. Uh, so um, I'll say, I'll divide into two. What has been the hardest thing you have to do? And also, I guess, the most meaningful, or I know that you could basically said that during your presentation, but maybe you could say two things or summarize it, you know, about your service generally. And then by the same question will be for you, so you can think about it in the meantime. Um, what's the hardest thing? I think that um, whenever I'm asked this question, I always use the same quote. So um, in Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, the opening sentence actually of the book is that um, all happy families are alike, of a, a, but each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And I think that really similar, um, it really says uh, it's all about what it means to be a casualty officer, because I think that every family grieves and deals with it um, in its own way. So sometimes you come to a family that even after 20 years is still very mourning and, and the entire visit will be about tears and about the, the missing, missing and you come to a different family and it will be a story about uh, how they celebrated life and or or something very joyful that happened to them and it will be all about laughs and um, it varies and, and I think that's some of uh, the difficulty because you can't really expect uh, when you come to a visit and you knock on the door and you stand um, outside their, their house and you, you prepare yourself to the visit, you don't really know what you're gonna, what you're gonna meet. So uh, I think that in a way for me, uh, for someone who comes into their home and needs to prepare herself, um, I think that it's something that is more complex. Um, but usually, um, I, I, I don't really remember the hardest um, scenario that I encountered. Um, but I think that uh, really to just modify yourself all the time uh, to the situation that the family um, actually that you're coming to see is dealing is something that uh, is very um, challenging in this job um, and beside that I'm, I'm sorry the, uh, the, the second part was about what I took from the job uh, or just uh, meaningful yeah mm. yeah um, and I'll, the, I'll just say um, someone asked another question, but and I and I know we're going towards the end. I want Nama to finish soon. I want to summarize, um, but I, I want to also respect that the people want to are interested. Yeah, so um, someone kind of asked if uh, the emotional toll about dealing with casualties and how has this affected you. So if you could just put that as part of wow. your summary as well. I know it's a difficult yes. question. Just put as part yes. of our summary, and then I'll let Nama summarize before I summarize. Um, Yes, of course. Uh, well, actually, it's a very good question. Um, the, the emotional toll of um, the take care um, is also uh, very big. Uh, we actually have um, sessions with a therapist. Um, I think it's twice a month uh, during when you fulfill the job. Um, in the army because they know there is an emotional toll. Uh, first of all, um, is that when I did this, I, I was a 19 year old uh, 
girl actually um, dealing all day with death actually uh, hearing stories going to memorials um, and <laughs> is complex but um, the IDF is aware of that and he lets us um, um, have have tools to take care of ourselves and the, the mini sorry and the meaningful thing that I was going to say is actually seeing the beautiful um, faces of all sorts of Israelis actually is um meeting families from different backgrounds and hearing stories about soldiers um coming from different places and actually just hearing and i i, I take it as uh something that uh, is very important to me uh to hear another story and another story uh, about those soldiers and their stories it's something that has a lot of meaning to me so it's not something specific as doing this job thank you so much and now um, i'll let you summarize as well uh, i said um, i said the hardest thing or meaning most meaningful thing but basically you can just summarize about how your military experience was um i would just say that my my military experience uh, my experience in the military was uh, very, very meaningful. There were a lot of hard stuff about it. I mentioned, as I mentioned before, the emotional toll of also what I was dealing with, with um, was difficult. Um, the thing was, I was the, I was connecting these soldiers to the army. I was the one representing um, the army to them and also to their parents. Sometimes I would get phone calls from parents, and uh, soldiers would be very demanding because they were very frustrated with their situation. Um, so it'd be it was, sometimes it was a, it was difficult to. To have to take that all in and have them um, pour it out all on me. Um, but at the same time, it was also very meaningful when I was able to actually help them and see the difference that I was making. Not that it happened a lot, but those, those few moments, um, those are when I really felt the significance of my um, time in the Army. Thank you, Nama. And uh, with that, I'm going to summarize and say that I think it was, it's very unique that I also, that um, this session was about caring for wounded soldiers and specifically I chose it right before um, Yom Hazikaron and, um, and which is Israel's Memorial Day, which is beginning tomorrow night. And also I, also the thing is, is that Nama just finished her mandatory service and Noah is continuing um, and then, and then Noah is, a, is currently, you know, 35 years old and she's a, a casualty officer and continuing to be involved and has been involved since 2003. Could really compare experiences and also see, you know, someone who's been in the Army for a while armed with someone who's also what a mandatory service looks like compared to a reserves um, service as well. And um, I just want to also do additional uh, promotion before I um, say thank you. So um, tomorrow for Erev Yom Zikaron um, and Yom Zikaron as well, I um, created a special project called Zikaron Packets. I've chosen 20 soldiers who have um, died in the service of, of Israel, of their, of, to their country, to Israel. Um, and they also have songs written about them. So um, basically I translated biographies, translated songs and, and Go, and if, for those who are interested, I send via email, uh, personally, a, a bio and a song about a specific soldier. Um, and I will be sending those tomorrow. Um, so if anybody is interested, here is the form that I'm sending right now. All you need is to send me your name and your email, basically, and I will send you one. Uh, but the idea is to really have a personal connection um, for Tioma Zikaron and... Um, connect to a specific soldier, to a specific, and have a song to connect to as well. So uh, feel free to fill that out and I would be happy to send it to you. And also please feel free to share with your community, other people who you think might be interested. Um, wonderful. Uh, so I will, uh, so with that, I just wanna say thank you everyone for joining. And also thank you for all um, the meaningful words and comments. It means a lot uh, to know that doing something like this is meaningful to the community, to people who are participating, and uh, I really appreciate it. I have the recording, so if you are interested, I will also send my uh, email in the 
in the chat. So everyone in the interest of just do control C very quickly. Um, also, you can just find my name, Netta Asner. Um, you can Google it and you'll find it. I'm from B'nai Israel. My email is all over the place. So uh, feel free to reach out if you want the recording, if you want any of the information I just said as well. Um, so thank you again for joining. And um, thank you so much to Noah and to Nama for sending, um, for, for, sorry, for sharing your experiences, for sharing also uh, your really emotional um, experience as well in the Army, which are not easy. And I think that this has been a very meaningful session for me also as well towards Yom Hazikaron. So thank you both so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everyone. Have Bye. a great day and a meaningful week. Toda Nama. Nama? Yes. It's Linda. I just want to say hello. It was very hello. nice. You look wonderful. Net, I already told you you look wonderful. So that's Thank a you. <laughs> there. I know she is. And I saw Lance. And I saw Essie and Avia, but they disappeared. So. All right. oh, they disappeared. Ilana, <laughs> you're not mute.